Okay, welcome to problem 91C. Now, if you've been watching the previous videos, problems 91A, 91B, I hope that you've seen the similarities. Yes, one was a lower tail test, one was an upper tail test, but the process of hypothesis testing is so similar. And it's going to be that way for module 9, module 10, module 11, 12, 13. You're going to see so many similarities throughout much of what we are doing over the next few modules. But you need to be very careful that as much as it can be beneficial to, to recognize and take advantage of the similarities in all of the different tests that we're going to be doing, you have to be very careful to keep an eye out for any little thing that may be different. And frequently what I see when I'm teaching this course is that students, they get into a habit, you get into a routine of hypothesis testing. Formulate the test, test statistic, p-value, critical value, conclusion, interpretation. That's always the same. And what I notice more often, I think, than anything else is students will often forget to see the small little differences that might arise. And those little differences are the difference between getting it right and getting it wrong. So it's good to appreciate and take advantage of the similarities in everything that we're going to be doing. But don't forget about the little differences and, and don't overlook small differences because that makes all the difference in the world as far as your grade is concerned. Okay, so let's go through this. There's a, not a lot different here. I can see there's going to be one small little detail, but let's see how it goes. Okay, so we are assuming car salespeople historically sell an average of 96 cars per year. In an effort to increase car sales, the regional manager proposes a new commission structure in hope of increasing the incentive for salespeople to sell more cars. After the first year of this new pay structure, we had to take a sample of 26. Okay, so here I'm getting into, uh, again, highlighting important information as it comes up. So I've got my current average is 96. We take a sample of 26 salespeople and they show an average number of cars sold of 98. Assume the population variance is known to be 49. Do we have evidence to show that the new commission structure has increased the average number of cars sold? Okay, so we've got all of our important information to perform the test. Also, yes, we do need our level of significance, but usually that's easy enough to find. And it doesn't change very often, but again, it doesn't change very often, but sometimes it will. And we want to make sure that we don't overlook that. So what are we doing? Formulate our test. Okay, I'm going to set up my null and my alternative here. We're testing a single population mean. And again, you know, these headings are giving you more information than you would have if this problem came out on an exam or on an assignment, right? One of the most difficult parts of hypothesis testing tends to be, what the heck am I testing? Or what am I doing? What is this? And again, it really takes a good understanding of that problem so that you can extract little clues or hints that are telling you what is it you should be testing. And for me, that's that big clue. I'm testing to see if we have evidence of an increase. So here was the current, right? We have 96 is the kind of the historical average. We've put in place a new commission structure, a new incentive program in hopes of increasing that average. So is our new average, is it greater than the previous. So I'm going to formulate this as an upper tail test to justify my formulation. Well, again, I need to explain what the null hypothesis tells us and what the alternative hypothesis tells us. So I would say if the evidence supports the alternative hypothesis, we have evidence to show that this commission structure worked. 
it actually did um, achieve its goal of increasing car sales. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, well, now we're unable to show that it had any statistically significant impact on car sales. So that's how I would write my null and alternative hypotheses. And of course, what I just said is how I would justify or how I would explain that formulation. Calculate the test statistic. Okay, so once again, let's go through this visually just so that we can really see what's happening. So again, we assume HO is true and always true with equality. So I have a mean of 96. From that distribution, I have drawn a sample with a mean of 98. What is the likelihood of that happening? So again, now we are determining, given that assumption, what is the probability of drawing a sample with a mean of 98 from a distribution with a mean of 96? Given, of course, that you know there's some variation of, of observations, there's a distribution of sample means that we might draw from any distribution. So, same process. As before, we now want to normalize or standardize that value so that we can compare it to our standard normal distribution. So I'm going to take this value and put that into my formula. And here's where we might make a mistake. Because Generally speaking, when you're given that formula for a test statistic, well, you can see here, that is the standard deviation. But what I'm given here is the variance. So this is just one of those small, small details that really makes all the difference. Because if you're going through this process habitually, like a routine, you've done it so many times, you think you know how to do it all the time, and you're doing the same, 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 same. Well, you might overlook that little detail. You have to make sure, of course, that the information that you're given in the problem is consistent with how you are to enter it into the formula. So here I need that standard deviation. It's giving me a variance. Well, I want the square root of that, which that's just 7. So now I can work that into my standard, uh, into my formula. Or we could also just adapt the formula to go along with the data that we've been given. Either one works perfectly fine. I'm just going to clean this up. I don't want to have everything written down twice. This is crowded enough as it is. So here's our, our sample data. 98 minus our hypothesized value. And this is 7 over root. Oops, I have a sample size of 26. I'm going to pull up my calculator. And here I have 98 minus 96 divided by... 7 over, that's 26 root. And so that gives me a test statistic of, we'll round it to two decimals, 1.46. And so in my standard normal distribution, that's out here somewhere, 1.46. Okay, now, what do we do with this? Same process, p-value, critical value. Why don't we start with the critical value this time? The other videos we've gone through with the p-value approach first. So let's do the critical value first. So our level of significance again is alpha, which means I wanna find that critical value that has an area of 0 0.05 in the upper tail because I'm doing an upper tail test. 
So I'm going to come down to my Z distributions I have down here somewhere. Oh, they're still messy from a previous question. That's going to give away an answer, I think. So I'm doing an upper tail test. My critical value needs to be positive because that's what's going to be in that upper tail. So if I bypass all the negative values here and pretend like you didn't see that because that's giving away answers. So if I am looking for that positive value, well, looking at this table that has all positive values, I'm not going to find that level of significance of 0.05. And once again, it's because our tables are giving us lower tail probability. So if I want that value that gives me an area of 0 0.05 in the upper tail, well then I want that value that gives me an area of 1 minus 0.05 or 0.95 in the lower tail. So we look through this table and I find 0.95, well, that's just right exactly in between these two numbers. So that gives me the first couple of digits, 1.6. And 0.95 is right in the middle here. So if I just follow these up, and I have 0 0.04 and 0 0.05, well, the number that I would want my second and third decimal, that's going to be right in between those two. Again, because 0.95 is between those two values. So it's a little bit tedious here, but here I can see then that that Z for 0 0.05 is going to be 1.6, and right in the middle here is 4.5. So that gives me that upper tail critical value. Now, again, there's a shortcut here, right? Because I know that distribution is perfectly symmetric, I know that the area in the upper tail for 1.645 is exactly the same as the area in the lower tail for 1.645, negative 1.645. So I can take advantage of this symmetry and kind of skip over having to deal with this 1 minus alpha. If I just look on the negative side, so here these are all the negative values, well now I can see, again, it's not perfect, but I can see 0.05 is between these two values. Well, there's negative 1.6. And if I scroll up here, there's 4 and 5. So my critical value, negative 1.6, 1.645. Now, here I'm looking at that lower tail probability. So if this is that distribution, Well, here I have found that the area to the left of negative 645 is 0 0.05. This distribution is perfectly symmetric. What I want is an upper tail probability because I'm doing an upper tail test. So because this distribution is perfectly symmetric, I know that if I just take the value positive 1.645, that's going to give me that area in the upper tail of 0 0.05. So that's our critical value for this test as well. So here, let's take a different color. So that's greater than, here we'll put that over here, 1.645. So that gives me this area here is 0 0.05. Well, based on our critical value approach, I can see that my test statistic is smaller 
than that critical value. And because it's smaller than that critical value, well, its p-value, this area here, it must be greater than. We haven't looked it up yet, but clearly that purple area is greater than this green area. So because in this upper tail test, my test statistic is smaller than that critical value, my p-value must be greater than. If I find that it's not, it means I've screwed up somewhere and I need to go back and figure out where my mistake is. That's one of the benefits of doing both the p-value approach and the critical value approach is that it's kind of a double check because your results must always be the same. Doing them both allows you to see, hopefully, that you've done it correctly because if you find a different conclusion using one method over the other, it's because you've screwed up. It's not because the tables are wrong. It's because you've made a mistake. So let's go through and make sure we get the same conclusion with our, our p-value. And we better find our p-value is going to be greater than 0.05. So here I'm going to take my test statistic, 1.46. Now again, you can fast forward this. But if I go through and I look at positive 1.46, Here's that positive 1.4 and there's 6. I get this value here, 0.9279, which absolutely, there's going to be somebody who wants to tell me that p-value is equal to 0 0.9, what did I say, 979, oh, 927. But again, this is a lower tail probability. So our p-value has to come, because it's an upper tail test, we want it to be the area in the upper tail. So it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.927. Or I can just skip this step altogether and again take advantage of the symmetry of this distribution look at my test statistic on the lower tail, negative 1.46. And oops, what am I looking? There we go, 1.46. And from down here, I need a bigger screen. And there's my p-value. So yes, we're looking up negative 1.46. And that's telling us the area in the lower tail is 0.07. So here I have negative 1.46. This area here is 0.07. What I want is the upper tail probability. This distribution is perfectly symmetric. So with my test statistic, 1.46 in the upper tail, this area here is 0 0.07 in the upper tail. So we get a consistent conclusion. I find here this purple area, it is greater than alpha. That is what we expected given that my test statistic is smaller than that critical value. So in both these cases, I see that my p-value, which is 0 0.07, is greater than my alpha, which is 0 0.05. I also see that my test statistic is less than, well, let's write it like this, my test statistic, which is 146, is less than my critical value and so based on both of those results we have insufficient evidence to reject right because once more this is my level of comfort my tolerance towards committing a type 1 error this is my exposure to committing a type 1 error 
this p-value of 0.07, again, we can think of it as a conditional probability. If the null is true, and if I choose to reject, there's my exposure to a type 1 error. Well, as my level of significance says, I'm only comfortable with a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. I am not willing to take that chance. A rejection with this evidence is exposing me to a type 1 error with a greater probability than what I'm comfortable with. And so it's because of that I am not going to reject. I am going to say I have insufficient evidence to support the alternative hypotheses. It does not mean that the alternative isn't true. The alternative could very well be true. In other words, we might be committing a type 2 error here by saying that our evidence supports the null and not the alternative. So I might be wrong, but I don't know if I'm wrong. We won't know if I'm wrong. Because to know if I'm wrong means that I know what the actual population mean is. And if I know that, why am I doing the test? So we don't know if we're wrong. We can only control our exposure to these errors. So here with a p-value of 0 0.07, I'm not going to reject the null hypotheses. Doing so would expose me to a type 1 error and I, at a probability that I'm not comfortable with. So I'm not going to reject. My evidence supports the null hypotheses. What does that mean? Well, let's come back to our problem. We're looking at car sales. We've put in a new commission structure um, in hopes of increasing car sales. Our alternative supported the claim that car sales increased, that the incentive worked. The null hypothesis showed no we don't have evidence to show that your incentive worked. My evidence here is supporting the null. I am unable to reject. My interpretation, therefore, is we have insufficient evidence to show that your new incentive structure worked. We are unable to show that the increase in car sales is actually statistically significant. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. We've gone through this type of test a few times now. And we can see again that we don't know with certainty. We'll never know with certainty whether or not the null is true or the alternative is true. All we're doing is gathering evidence. And the evidence comes to us in various strengths. Weak evidence or strong evidence or insufficient evidence. This is insufficient evidence to support the alternative hypotheses. So once again, based on our findings, we're unable to reject the null hypotheses. We're unable to show that your new incentive structure has had a statistically significant impact or improvement on car sales. Okay, everybody, I hope that this was helpful. Thank you all so much for watching. And uh, we'll be back again soon with another video. Take care. Bye-bye.